Welcome to episode 6 of the Builder's Diary by Cloud on Out. Get insights into the day-to-day -day challenges of builders. In this episode, Vilius from our partner Demikin shares insights into building serverless applications in a DevOps culture. Our partner Demikin is one of the largest technical consulting teams and leading Atlassian full-service provider in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Demikon is growing its cloud division and therefore hires cloud and DevOps engineers, cloud architects, and more. Demikon is a remote-first company hiring in Germany and Europe. So check out the show notes or video descriptions for details and apply today. So first of all, I want uh, to introduce Vilius Kukanauskas, uh, who started his career as a software developer implementing Avadin and Spring Boot applications, for example. And in 2019, Vilius transitioned from a software to a DevOps engineer role and got in touch with AWS, um, infrastructure as code, Kubernetes, and so on. In January 2022, Vilius took his career in a new direction and he joined Demikon as a DevOps and cloud engineer. So welcome to the show, Vilius. Hi, Andreas. Thanks for having me. You have an interesting career, so you started as a software developer, and I would like to know what did you enjoy most about writing software, about being just a software developer? Uh, it actually started basically from the childhood. It was fascinating for me. I can write something back days. It was on Commodore 64, and then it appears. I really remember my first Hello World. It was basically Hello Willows, and it runs endlessly on the screen. And I had to turn off my computer because I didn't know how to stop the program. <laughs> and for me, it was, <laughs> it was fascinating. Uh, and uh, luckily, I still have this fascination uh, when, when it works. When you try something and it works, like I'm only writing text. It's like I'm only writing and something mm. magically happens. <laughs> is, is, isn't it like awesome? <laughs> It's like yeah, the, it the, the closest we can get to magic. You write a magic spell <laughs> and then it works. <laughs> yeah. So this, uh, this uh, I like a lot. So when, when something works, when something uh, appears on your screen, which you wrote before and it, it works the way you want it to, it still uh, gives me endorphin. And uh, I think this is the main reason yeah, why I like being a developer. Okay, cool. And, and then what did you miss when being a software developer? So why did you to decide to jump into kind of a DevOps role? Um, yeah, I was missing like the finish. Um, I was feeling like I'm doing a part of the circle. Um, I was writing the code, the text, and uh, but how will it became alive? Uh, in the previous companies, the, all the pipelines were already set up, so I only need to make it push. And it magically appeared, like on the test server, or if you merged them in, then on the prod. But how? How did it happen? Um, I felt like I need that to fully understand the circle of life, so to say. How, how will this text, which I wrote, became the living product? So that's why uh, it was only natural for me that after I have wrote a software, I also want to uh, deploy it. And how? How? Mm -hmm. It was curiosity. Yeah. Okay. Sounds very cool because yeah, basically that's the magic when you write a program on your local machine and you just execute it, then it just starts working. But when you work in a more complex scenario and someone else is doing the deployment and operations, you're basically missing that part of the creation process. Yeah, I can fully understand. Yeah. <laughs> I can fully understand that. So um, yeah, talking about DevOps. So how would you um, define the word DevOps? So what's behind DevOps? Yeah, I think I have a bit more radical um, um, declaration in my mind. Uh, for me, DevOps is uh, from two words, develop and operate. It's both. So uh, to call myself DevOps, I need to write the service, all the good jam, the TDD, the clean code, mwah, make it nice. But then when you're done with the service, you are the perfect person on the entire planet. You are the only one who exactly knows what the service needs. You know what uh, databases it needs. You know what environment variables it needs. You know how much RAM or how much runtime. You know everything about it. So it just makes perfect sense that you are the one who also then deployed, operated. So uh, for me, uh, to call myself DevOps engineer, I have to do both. Write the service and operate it. 
if I'm only deploying software which other people wrote, then I personally don't feel like a DevOps engineer. I feel like a system administrator or um, if I'm only making networking, then I feel like a cloud infrastructure engineering. So for me, the DevOps is quite specific. You write and you operate and else mm -hmm. you're only yeah. developer or only admin. Yeah, and yeah, you're making a good point. So because the one who writes the code knows the m very much about the whole system, <laughs> obviously, and is therefore the perfect um, the perfect match for also operating the service. And I think I would take it. Uh, I would add one more thing. It's ev also you get a lot of feedback. So as a developer, if you also operate your application, you're getting a lot of feedback from production. So you, you, you see what's going on, you see um, maybe something that uh, do not work very efficiently in your code or stuff like that, and you can optimize based on that feedback. And, and I, I want to share one, one uh, story of, of my career. So I, I was also transitioning from a developer to a DevOps engineering role. And there was even one more thing on top because we also did uh, customer support for the application for a period of time. So that meant um, we, we're getting feedback from our metrics and infrastructure and everything for no deployment, but also from the customers calling in or writing emails. And this was, uh, for the first time, I, I, f I found that so useful as a developer because I learned so much about how are people using my software, how does it work in production, how does it uh, run on the machines and everything. So, yeah, I think this is really fascinating. If, you are, if you're feeling like a creator and you, you want to bring things into action, um, getting all that feedback um, is, is really, uh, really cool. It is also highly efficient, in my opinion, because if something doesn't work, like, a, I don't know, error, and then uh, if there are two separated roles, then they're starting ticket, pushing like, hey, here, probably database is running. No, no, probably network. But if you have built everything, you see the error. Ah, I'm going to check the database. Ah, I'm going to check this. I gonna, you, it's a lot faster if you know everything about your system, about the product, so you can dig deep in every corner that you need and uh, navigate a lot faster through debugging uh, process. Yeah. So it's efficient. Yeah, it, it works well for small teams, uh, yes. I would say, and for maybe less complex uh, systems uh, where, where you can do all of that because it's a lot of work as well. <laughs> so if you're the one writing features, doing support, doing operations, that's a lot <laughs> on the list. Um, yes. But I absolutely, so as you don't have handoffs between people, you're not losing anything and uh, things are uh, working smoothly. I enjoy, I enjoy working in, um, in situations like that a lot. Mm. <laughs> yeah. In 2022, you started um, as a cloud and DevOps engineer at Demicon. So could you share um, what was your motivation to apply for that position? Uh, remote first was basically the main motivation. Um, okay. I, um, in the Corona years, I uh, learned how to work remotely. I was at the beginning skeptical how it's going to be because I never before had the situation usually if you start somewhere you have problems you go to some other colleagues you clap on the shoulder have a chat and i thought how, how is it gonna work out and it worked out superiorly it was super good i just had like all the times i could ask my colleagues in in the past company we also always found time where we could make screen sharing and work together and i enjoy it very much so i said okay technically I do not need to go to office anymore. We have webcams, we have screen share, we can always talk with each other. This is great. And the second, I love to sleep. When I work from yeah. home, I can sleep longer. I'm home sooner. <laughs> I see my yeah. family at lunch. If, if I'm lucky, like uh, there are a lot of benefits mm -hmm. and the benefits heavily outweigh the things like, yes, you don't uh, meet your colleagues in real life every day. And uh, the, benefits are just, the benefits are just a lot greater uh, for me. So remote first was a, a main factor. And the second, I also wanted to try consulting because previously to learn new stuff, to learn new technologies, I had to switch the company, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which I was mm -hmm. doing a lot. And now mm -hmm. as a consultant, there's a chance. And so far it turned out to be true that I can just uh, get another client, another project inside the same company. So mm -hmm. this is the first time for me. I have never done that before. I was always intern previously. And now mm -hmm. I see myself more like an IT mercenary. You get into the firefighting, you will be thrown in and something and you have to do your job. So mm -hmm. this is for me also something new, uh, to learn something new, new way of working. Okay. 
Yeah, so, so being a consultant really helps to learn about new technologies because you're constantly throwing in uh, thrown into different projects with different tech stacks and situations. And um, what I also like about it, you also get to know a lot of people <laughs> because you work together with many, many different people from different companies. And I think that's also, um, yeah, we learn a lot from that as well um, about different, I don't know, different team topologies or how they organize their, their, their company and stuff like that. So you can learn a lot um, uh, by that as well. So, yes. um, so you're now working at Demicon for a little longer than a year. So um, can you share some of the projects you have been working on? So just a brief overview, what kind of projects have you been working on? Uh, yeah, uh, when I started, uh, I was clearly communicating that I love serverless world and that I would love to work with it. And like the first project was more, we were uh, creating a um, step function uh, project where mm -hmm. we basically had to import huge amounts of data and uh, all the data were chained together in lambdas. And to change the lambdas, we used a step function and uh, we wrote everything with AWS CDK in TypeScript. Mm -hmm. So it was like uh, first for me to work with TypeScript uh, also. And uh, everything was written then in TypeScript, uh, also front end, the back end, also our front end guy who was like 10 times or 100 times better in TypeScript than me, helped me a lot. <laughs> he was a strict teacher. And mm -hmm. um, everything uh, was serverless. We used DynamoDB, step function, lambda, so it was really nice. Later on, we, uh, I have also moved to another project where we have more um, static um, pods running, like for all the infrastructure, if you want to deploy stuff like uh, tools for other people, like Jira, Confluence, uh, they all, those are servers that need to be available all the time. So my current job is more on the deeper level, level uh, on the network level, on the permanently uh, running pods level. This is also where Kubernetes comes in and also this time not with CDK, but with Terraform. So those are the two biggest projects, I would say, with a few side steps to something smaller. But mm -hmm. yeah, from serverless to Terraform Enterprise and Kubernetes, those are basically my fingers okay yeah quite a lot in a year i would say <laughs> quite a lot different technologies to to dive into um okay and um so so now we have a look back um in the past year so what do you see coming for this year so what is the next step in your career development where are you heading to something uh totally different which i just started and this is what i love about demicon I wanted this year to come out a bit out of my comfort zone. Last year, I was like hiding and the company is like, oh, I'm only going to do technical stuff. And this year I decided, OK, step up. And I'm currently participating in a training for corporate influencer, like so that I have to learn more how to talk and work with people on, on LinkedIn, how to generate content, how to communicate, how to expand my social networking. So this is something totally non-technical. And I talked with my team leader about it and he was, yeah, go for it. We'll just have the training. So this is something totally new and I'm very happy that Demicon gives me a chance to do it. Uh, second thing also, um, I'm using uh, chat GTP almost every day in my DevOps work. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just fabulous. It's like having an expert on your side. If I need to write something or I have some questions where I know that I can use it, I'm uh, mm -hmm. definitely using it. And uh, it also isn't always perfect. I also found it's outdated. It's not up to date. If I use today's version, sometimes it gave me code which simply doesn't work. So mm -hmm. I'm um, definitely looking forward to using more AI in my daily work. And I'm not the only one. The Demiconians are crazy about AI. <laughs> <laughs> so this is awesome. Maybe we can also, and this is more my personal wish maybe we can somehow participate in the growing AI scene. Maybe Demicon can offer some solutions for all the AI startups, maybe some DevOps solutions. Maybe we can prepare something for them and then uh, cooperate with them. But this is more my like my personal vision. As currently, okay. it is like net, uh, network layer and keep the service on running. <laughs> <laughs> this is like my today's job. So I don't know how it will be in half a year, but I'm looking forward to it. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Okay, so um, I want to come back to the more technical uh, part. And um, so you already briefly mentioned, but I want to go into details. So 
What was the first time you worked on a production grade serverless application and how did that look like? Oh yeah, it was actually, I learned a lot in this time where we had to, our task was to move a Spring Boot application into AWS Lambdas, which mm -hmm. isn't a good fitting. <laughs> it really <laughs> isn't. So serverless uh, is like for quick starts, uh, you start in milliseconds and Spring Boot, it starts like in half a minute and then runs mm -hmm. for eternity and it's very fast and it's running, it's, it's good. Mm -hmm. But but uh, like the, the, fast, the starting time of half a minute is not acceptable for Lambda. Mm -hmm. And uh, we then, uh, it was brute force, we pushed it into a Lambda, the Spring Boot code. Luckily it wasn't mm -hmm. so big, but it was still. And to make it work actually as a Lambda, uh, there's some technical details to it. Um, if you keep the Lambda so-called warm, mm -hmm. you have to like call the Lambda and then the container beneath, it stay alive, Back in the days, it stayed alive, I think, for four and a half hours. I don't know what how it is today. It's been like two, three years. And then mm -hmm. if you permanently send a request for mm -hmm. that container, so it, it's the so-called keep alive request, then mm -hmm. you don't have this half a minute boot time for this one mm -hmm. uh, Lambda container, which is beneath uh, it. And we used trick like this. So we mm -hmm. were permanently, permanently sending request and in the lambda itself we had right at the beginning the recognizer if it has the keyword stay alive then okay do nothing <laughs> and mm -hmm. only if it doesn't have it then uh, proceed the request so it was really hacky it wasn't good and later on everything was rewritten first mm -hmm. it was rewritten in pure java and then later it was rewritten in golang mm -hmm. so but the very very first step was just to move spring boot into lambda <sighs> oh so, so yeah, so actually that sounds like you've been doing a lift and shift <laughs> of a Spring Boot application uh, to a Lambda function, which is may maybe a good starting point so to get a feeling for the technology. And um, you just try to move it as it is uh, to a Lambda function and then you, are, yeah, you have to deal with all those, <laughs> with all those things. For example, that um, you have to keep the container warm and you have that startup time. So yeah, interesting. Um, what what was the the other parts of the architecture like? So you had the lambda function mm. to answer requests. Was there an API gateway involved, or how did mm. you call the lambda function? Yeah, and this is where uh, I think where it's so important. Whereas as a DevOps, you make not only the lambda logic, but also mm. write the infrastructure because the project, the serverless projects, usually are a lot more than just simply application code from lambda. You have huge. Mm project you have uh, chained together queues for example we had we worked a lot with uh, sqs a mm -hmm. simple queue services because we had a one-to-one -one asynchronous uh, message bus type so to say mm -hmm. and uh, it was streamlined uh, streamlighted and we had uh, logging also manually uh, implemented so um, it was about 46 different steps if, if I would check the entire project. So we had mm -hmm. used different lambdas, I think maybe 10, 15 different lambdas, uh, different queues, uh, serverless databases, as DynamoDB we had used into it. And um, regarding on what logic logic was happening, uh, we used like also the email services for client notifications. From today's point of view, uh, we could have done a few things differently, but back then, we were still learning. It was for, for us like the first, for many of us, it was the first serverless project. Mm. And we, yeah, we didn't know better. <laughs> so, but no, it's, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's how it works for, <laughs> for most of us. So for me as well. So you have to get a little bit familiar with the way serverless works, with its limitations, how you work around them, how you design an architect. Um, so what, what would you say, what excites you about serverless architectures? What are the advantages, the most important ones in your opinion? It's basically also a reproduction of our today's habits in a service habits. As example, if you want a tap of water, you go into the kitchen, psh, psh, open, close. This is serverless. Mm. If you would have a waterfall coming down in your bathroom where permanently water is running, <laughs> this, is, this is the basic server which all the mm -hmm. time you open the refrigerator, the lamp goes on while it's open. You close it, it goes off. This is serverless thinking. You need mm -hmm. only those resources that you need. If you need a function only to run a few times a week, what's the sense of making a pot in a Kubernetes which runs all the time, wasting resources, it's not good for the environment. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just be resourceful. And also you have to know when it doesn't make sense. 
if you have something like Jira service running, yeah, you have Jira server running. You don't <laughs> chain a bunch of lambdas. So uh, you have to recognize when it makes sense, mm-hmm. when to do it, and, um, and also how to do it. But you only use serverless services. When you start with one, you don't want even one like stateful, I don't know, MySQL database which is running on an EC2 machine because it will be a bottleneck. It works fine maybe if you're getting 100 requests per minute, but what if you get like a million requests per minute? As mm-hmm. In serverless world, everything scales up. It's fine unless you have like uh, constrictions uh, con- made, made for on your own. But uh, as soon as you have one non-serverless component, one static server running, it will be the bottleneck for everything. So... Go full serverless mm. if you can. If it makes sense, try it. It's so nice. It just scales up. Chain all the nice services together. Also, you have to learn like SNS, SQS. When do you new, uh, use what? What message bus do you using? You can use also for AWS the step function. It's like the to chain up the lambdas with each other. And step function has also one nice benefit for business because it generates you a nice graph which you can then show in your sprint reviews or for the business users who don't know how to read code, step functions mm-hmm. are generating also the logical graphs. So this mm-hmm. is like additional benefit. You can like screenshot and show it to your product owner and say, look, this is our logic. Is it the way you need it? And then he can easily say, ah, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's, oh, yes, yes, yes. So it's it's a benefit. It's like a given. Mm-hmm. So, so when, when comparing running an application on virtual machines and more traditional uh, architectures compared to running applications on serverless in, in production, so from an operating perspective, what's your uh, impression about the differences here? Uh, I think one of the challenge when you work with serverless is the logging. Mm, if you like work with uh, lambdas and you have 100 different lambdas, every day is their own log group, mm. fi- find the error. <laughs> uh, it's it's harder, so you need a centralized logging, in my opinion. And we also mm-hmm. use that when we were working with um, serverless application. You have to take care of the logging, uh, centralize them, so you have easier uh, browsing for them. Mm-hmm. Um, you also, of course, have to think stateless. Uh, in in a server, you might have some files or stuff like this. You don't have this in serverless world. Everything which you need to save for later on, you have to take care of it. They, the benefit is okay. You will never run out into errors like "oh, disk run out of space." <laughs> this isn't <laughs> happening in serverless if you are uh, planning accordingly, because you don't even save anything in the space. You know the the lambda or the it will die in a few minutes. You will lose everything. So no, don't don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, think differently. Uh, it's I think like the debug is like you have to have all the system in your mind. If you see an error, it can be that the cause for the error has happened like a two services before. Mm. So uh, it can be more complex depending on the architecture. You have more places to look. It's not only like, I will check the server logs. No, which, mm. which? It's not only one machine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think so. What, I, what I've learned a lot is so, so all those serverless architectures, they basically um, bundle together a few highly distributed systems provided by AWS. That's basically what you do. S3, Lambda, all those things are really distributed systems that AWS operates for us. And um, this increases the complexity when you have to debug or um, uh, also I think also when you write code and architect. Um, but on the on the upside, what you get is uh, you get the scalability, and what I also think the availability is really important because I so when I compare applications running in containers or on virtual machines with the ones that are running serverless that I operate uh, or responsible for operating them, um, then I I really see that it's the effort of operating those services when are serverless is 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 almost zero. I sometimes get an alarm and then I see, okay, this is just a small outage on the API gateway or somewhere. Uh, I don't have to do anything about it because that's just um, um, part of the system that basically um, yeah, has self-healing capa- capabilities, uh, does things on this on their own, and I don't have to, I don't know, restart a machine or log into a machine and, <laughs> and see what's going on. And I think that's the that's the that's the upside. And I th- would say, yeah, the downside is that logging, debugging, and everything uh, is is becoming more complex. Yeah, definitely great point. You don't need to de- to restart a lambda. <laughs> 
or yeah. as free. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does automatically, basically. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Plan. Okay. Um, so why do you think um, serverless is a perfect fit when aiming for DevOps principles? Uh, so when building your organization in that way, as as uh, DevOps by my definition, you need right to do both to write the code and deploy the code. And in many cases, in serverless world, the infrastructure and the code are a lot more chained together than in monolithic approach. For mm -hmm. example, if you work with step function you're basically chaining different Lambda. So you have sometimes to change the formatting uh, in Lambda itself, or mm. you change it in the step function. So it's like, it's the same, it's the same project. You just use, you, you can use, even use the same programming language. It's basically maybe a different file. The one is building the step function, which is then taking the JSONs and giving the JSONs away. And there's the Lambda who works with the JSONs. It's so interconnected. So uh, mm -hmm. it's just, it feels like it's not separated. It isn't different. It's just the same product. You just use like a, a different a one file for this, second for this, but they are so chained together. It doesn't make sense to say, I wrote the, the, the Lambda code. It is for sure perfect. My unit tests are green. It's your fault. No, my step function is great. It's your fault. It doesn't make sense. Just, just understand it, mm -hmm. use it. It's. It yeah, so, so basically the, the, the lines between dev and ops are, th there's basically no line between that <laughs> anymore because you, the, the configuration of the infrastructure becomes basically part of the application because the way I, I don't know, I configure the API gateway um, has an immediate effect on how my code is running there. So, so those things are really coupled together very tightly. And so it, it does, it's, it's much harder to have that line. So you are responsible for the infra and you are responsible for the application uh, code. So that's, that's no longer really working. And yeah. I would say one other aspect that comes to my mind is, so f from a, s thinking about it from a developer, um, the, 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 the level uh, of abstraction that you are working on here uh, compared to, I don't know, doing virtual machines or even containers, you're, you're not really caring about a lot of the things uh, <laughs> that we did for, for infrastructure um, uh, on AWS. So you don't do networking typically, you don't do um, um, machines and stuff like that. So operating systems, all that stuff is gone basically. It's all abstracted away. Of course, those things still exist, but uh, we, don't, mm -hmm. we don't interact, we don't see them anymore. So I think that is, um, when you are a developer, it's, um, it's um, interesting because you can get started deploying your application on th on the cloud infrastructure without yeah learning about networking about operating systems <laughs> about load balancers and all that stuff um uh, because you have a, a, a layer of abstraction on top of that i think that's a great point i like uh, the way you talk about it like serverless uh, projects might be the perfect place to introduce more developers classical developers into devops world mm -hmm. because they don't have to create all the stuff which you just mentioned, like all the network side rages, uh, routing tables, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they don't want to do that. But for them, it's easy, like, okay, I can use the same language, which I'm using to code. And I mm -hmm. just can create like uh, my, uh, I got a ticket, like if this and this happens, I need to send email. How do we do that? And we say, okay, we have the SNS, simple notification service, and we can just plug in, check it out. It's so easy. Look, this is SNS, you plug another subscriber to it, and you can send and it's, whoa, and most of developers, which I worked with, they were so excited. It's so easy. And I said, yes, yes, look, this is, this is the code. Just write the function. The resource will be created. Write your Lambda, chain it up. And they're wow, happy and want to try and play around and excited and easy entry. I think it's important. Good point that you made, but uh, it's like a good, it's a like hon honeypot for all the, you know, developers who would like <laughs> to be DevOps, but ah, I don't know, <laughs> networking. No, no, come into serverless world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Um, so, um, uh, so we already discussed that um, basically serverless blurs the lines between dev and ops. And we talked about some of the services like step functions. So maybe we can dive a little bit more into detail. So how does the infrastructure become um, combined with the application code? So for example, when we, when we think about step functions, can you maybe um, explain that a little bit? So what are step functions and how do you 
use them to to build mm. up your application. Step step function is actually a perfect example for um, application logic in infrastructure, because it uh, it's a tool from AWS uh, specifically like to combine lambdas and it uh, works by putting payloads from one lambda to another, simplified. But it can also interact on its own with the payload. So the step function it's like a huge state machine which then can also say okay in this step. I will check in the payload and if specific parameter is like this, I will do that. And if specific parameter is not like this, I will do that. Or the step function can say, okay, I will check in the payload and for every entry in this array, I will start a separate lambda. Like they, it has basic programming built in as if then for each. And so you don't have to write everything in your own lambda. You don't have to get, mm. oh, I will get this JSON and then I will get for every element in this array, I need to make logic. What if there are 10,000 elements? The Lambda <laughs> will run out and step mm. function will just start for every of those entry on its own, a separate Lambda. So it's a super usual, uh, useful tool. Mm. Uh, and you can, as because you are writing the logic with this tool, it will also become... Uh, you, you are getting the graphical overview for it. So all the logic for each if then um, you can show it to the business mm -hmm. people and you don't have to make your own diagram, it saves you time. So I think they, they have like five or six uh, basic logic uh, tools in the step functions. I don't know them all in my mind now, but it's usually enough um, to build the logic also on infrastructure level. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the that's the, in, the important point here. So, parts of your logic is basically part of the infrastructure configuration. Yes. So basically, the workflow defined in the step function is th theoretically its infrastructure is code. So you can write that with Terraform or CDK or CloudFormation, um, and then the Lambda function that gets invoked by step function is then executing basically only small snippets of code. This is also part of your application logic, but yeah, basically now here's a perfect example because parts of your application logic is in the workflow, which is part of the infrastructure as code, and others are part of the Lambda function code, um, which is, I would say, the, would say the traditional application code. Um, so yeah, but this is mixing those things together and it's no longer possible that you have two different people working on that stuff because you have, yeah, that's crazy because you have so many handoffs in between. So you need someone who understands both worlds to um, yeah, the infrastructure is code and also the, the application code. Um, and that's, that's important. And um, so I'm using step functions a lot as well. So um, I also love the way that it's really easy to invoke a Lambda function. And then step function does all the things like um, what you said, um, um, iterating over data or also the error handling. So when the Lambda invocation fails, it tries again. You can configure that as well. And what I'm also doing often is that I also invoke other AWS services. So mm -hmm. Let's say start a container on ECS and Fargate, uh, stuff like that. So ECS, uh, the step function really integrates into many, many AWS services as well, which is also very cool. Um, and then you even need less <laughs> code in your Lambda function because you can trigger other services just from uh, your step function. Um, that's, that's cool. Yeah. We have found one downside at a step function. Maybe I can also tell it and also how we solved it. It's more technical. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I hope it's been solved by the time we're recording this because it was <laughs> a bit of pain. It's limitation to 25,000 steps and without an ability to ask API on which step are we currently. Because we run into this problem, we migrated huge data sets and sometimes we run into uh, um, like overflow. And mm -hmm. the official solution from AWS, which we also then implemented, is like, yeah, count yourself. And after you think you're reaching the 25,000, <laughs> then start another step function with uh, the payload. Okay. And yeah. uh, we followed the tutorial of the AWS and we have done it. But I was so infuriate, like you are showing this in, in some front <laughs> of UI. You are counting. Why don't you give me the API? Maybe it's already available now. So yeah, we had to implement ourselves mm. a counter and it's a bit compl more complicated if you have a for each loop. So you have also like, okay, how do I do this? Mm. Uh, it was a bit tricky, but it was fun to solve it. So yeah, this uh, limitation of 25,000 uh, steps in one step function run true uh, was yeah. for us a bit pain in the ass. We solved it, but I hope in the future it will be solved more elegant from AWS. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've been, we've been running, so Michael and I have been running into this as well. So we mm. use the step function to iterate over all objects in an S3 bucket. <laughs> so this is basically <laughs> the challenge. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you can imagine, so you can quickly reach that limit of 20,000 um, steps or uh, um, in, yeah, transitions uh, very easily. And yeah, so we try to figure out some um, workarounds as well. So, but I, th I think yeah, that's a definitely um, a limit that many people reach when <laughs> using step functions. And it would be yeah. great if that limit would be increased, or uh, or there was some other uh, way around it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, can you think of? Um, so, this is a. I think this was a very good example. The step function, how the the infrastructure and the application logic um, uh, basically uh, fusions together. So, can you think of a, another example, another, another AWS service or part of the architecture where, where this becomes uh, um, possible? Maybe also the SNS implementation servers in combination with SQS uh, simple uh, queue servers. Because mm -hmm. often uh, some events um, in event-driven architecture, they have to uh, something has to happen and then something else has to happen. Like if the client clicks on the buy now, then you have to trigger multiple things. You have to check like validation. You have to check how many uh, do we actually have this article in our storage, and uh, all the time when you have the event-driven architecture. You can really easily chain those uh, events with IO infrastructure in AWS, for example, like with this SNS. Like, okay, if this happened, I want this, that, and that, and that. So it's perfect. Just use SNS. Sometimes they are chaining SNS with SQS so that you have more abstraction. And uh, like one example, event-driven architecture. Just uh, declare the events and chain them together. And one-to-one -one or one-to-n, whatever you want, there mm -hmm. are tools for this. You don't have to write code like i don't know in spring boot like while through run and listen stuff like this uh no mm -hmm. you can just declare the event on which we are listening and until this event is happening you won't waste any infrastructure uh, power you, you you just sleep and if this mm -hmm. event so event driven architecture is perfect with serverless i would say mm -hmm. yeah so for example and then Again, so if you, for example, you, you configure your SNS topic for receiving events and then you fan it out to multiple queues or other topics. And again, um, you can have filters in there to filter specific events and stuff like that. So again, part of the application logic is based part of your infrastructure because you no longer define that I want to listen for those events in your code, but you do it in your infrastructure code. And I think this is a, another very good example where those things um, come together. and. I would say overall, this is the pattern <laughs> with serverless applications. The, the infrastructure uh, configuration, infrastructure as code, and the application really comes together. So, so when you have to deploy the infrastructure as code and the application logic, so how do you do that? How do you organize your repositories, your CI/CD pipelines to accomplish that? Um, in the in, in Demicon, the, the serverless product which we had, we basically had the same repository. For, mm. or for, for for the project, um, but we had like one was folder just called lambdas, and mm -hmm. there were like five five or six lambdas. Then uh, we had uh, infra folder, and in the infra folder we declared like our DynamoDB, we declared the step functions. So we actually used the same application. It was for the backend. Mm -hmm. It was basically for the the backend gets uh, a call, and. Um, we um, had different. Uh, we used the Grafana. And we had different data sources also declared in the SDK. So uh, the front end only had one endpoint and the front end didn't know what we're gonna use. Sometimes we're using database, sometimes we're using some other data sources. The front end didn't know all of that, but you can declare it in the SDK. And uh, it was also like one folder for the lambdas, one folder for the infra, but all in the same repo. It was like our last approach. Um, I don't know if it is like the perfect approach. I don't know if it's fitting for all the projects, but for this one specific project, it was a backend who gives you information when you call him, when the frontend called him. And the frontend was in different repositories. So we separated those, but like mm -hmm. the, back, the backend had its uh, infra and uh, lambdas in the same mm -hmm. repo. Yeah, so, so based on our discussion so far, so as the infrastructure's code and the application code or logic or application logic basically uh, is a, a fusions together. So it makes for me total sense to put that in one repository so that you can also ship it with the same CI/CD pipeline um, and, mm. and just bring that into action. Yeah, it's a, 
it's an approach that I, I regularly do as well. Mm. Um, okay, yeah, okay, thank you very, very much for, for those insights. So, um, so we talked a lot about the advantages of serverless, what's, what's great about it. And uh, <laughs> so um, the, the next question is more going into what are the challenges of serverless? So where do you see uh, our organizations or teams are struggling when it comes to, to serverless? Well, of course, you have to know when you're not using serverless. The computation time of serverless is a lot ex more expensive than, for example, of mm -hmm. a typical EC2 machine. So if you uh, have lambdas running for, I don't know, for 15 hours a day, just just use a EC2 machine, just don't do it. If you don't need to, uh, unless you need to scale up and can do it in parallel. So know when to not do it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it comes with the uh, experience on the, um, on the architectural level. Also, um, the serverless thinking, it's more than just writing a code. Like you have to have the entire infrastructure in your head or in the architecture. You have to think about the scalabilities. Uh, you have to think about more, I would say. It's more complex than just, mm -hmm. okay, I will just boot up a Spring Boot application and it will somehow run. Um, no, um, because you have to decide beforehand is is a serverless approach a fitting one. So um, I would say it's you, you need a bit more knowledge. It's like the challenge. You could do it as always, just start up something and get a pot running who is empty 90% of the time, mm -hmm. or you can learn it. So maybe also the willingness to accept this new tech is also a challenge because if a team never worked with it, and why should they start with it? So uh, it needs um, reasoning mm -hmm. to, to get team to start work with it. You have to like to make a proof of concept to show that it's uh, what is its additional value. It's also possible that it isn't fitting for this project, but if it is fitting, um, it might be challenging. <laughs> Depends on the team and on the project probably. But yeah, mm -hmm. as with trying something new, you have to outweigh it. The pros has to outweigh the cons. It isn't uh, like self-explanatory, like your food <laughs> tastes bad, just use salt. <laughs> hey, no, it's, it's a bit harder than that. Yeah. So basically, actually, yeah, the, the learning curve, um, <laughs> there's quite a learning curve involved uh, when getting into serverless. I think it's even, so it looks very simple. Um, when you have, at the first sight, it looks very simple. Uh, but then when you really go into um, architecting and developing a serverless application, you, you, you find out about all those things that you uh, need to consider. Uh, you talked about the stateless um, um, machines or stateless uh, invocations, basically. Um, then I think there's things like, um, yeah, it's no longer just one process running on a single machine, but it's a highly distributed system. So you can't rely on things happening in order typically and stuff like that. So I think those are the, the, the challenges that you then later <laughs> get into. And um, yeah, but I think, um, yeah, you're right. So it's, it's about leaving your comfort zone. It's about learning a new technology. And but but when you can take advantage of the things we mentioned, the scalability, availability, also I think the deployments are very simple uh, to handle with the serverless. Then you can really benefit uh, of all of that. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> so a typical sysadmin that is coming into a serverless project. So how do you um, do? You have any advice, or how do you get into that? What do you need to learn? So where do you need to get started? Probably um, that there are more programming languages than Bash script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, to not be uh, afraid of it, because for developers, this is like the challenge or oh, ops, I don't want to do with networks. Or, and mm -hmm. no, don't be afraid. It's not only networking. So to be. Uh, to not be afraid to start something, to ask the colleagues, they will be more than happy. Like a developer will very be happy to explain for a new colleague from Ops how the code in Lambda works. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, at least the, the people who I have worked with always were very helpful and showed me things which I didn't understood how they work. So yeah, uh, don't be afraid to look into the Lambda. You will be surprised how easy and straightforward a good written Lambda is. Just mm -hmm. takes, takes a JSON, does something with it and throws a JSON away or gives or writes it in a queue or something like that. Don't, don't be afraid. And uh, ask your colleagues if you don't understand something. And most of the lambdas are um, really easy to understand small pieces of code with, I don't know, limited. It, it's not such a huge thing. Like uh, if you would check out the Spring Boot project, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. it's an entirely different world. But um, yeah, mm-hmm. you have to be ready to learn something new. You will need something new. But this new f- is actually cool. It's, <laughs> it's actually... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I, I, I think you will have fun. If you start, you will be surprised and then you will definitely grow a lot. You will level up in, in real life, so to say. Uh, go from Saiyan to Super Saiyan uh, because you will see oh, so much more power. You can do so much more stuff. And I think everybody will then get its own ideas how they can do it with their job. This is like the nice thing. You give to a person a new skill and you don't have to explain it how to do it. He will have his own ideas. So as soon as a SysOps guy will learn how to do lambdas, he will have, oh, I can automate this and that. Oh, I haven't thought about it. Oh, 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 oh. So I think this mm-hmm. would be like the cool thing. And the same also for developers. If they go into DevOps, so they, they could say, oh, I can automate the resource creation. I can do this. I can do that. So just <laughs> enable mm-hmm. people. Um, and then they will find the ways on how they can br- be better. Yeah, I really like that motivating statement at the end. I <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> I totally agree on that. So uh, thank you a lot for, for sharing your insights into uh, serverless and DevOps. I really enjoyed that. And um, if you, listener, are uh, interested in joining uh, Vilius and his team, so Demicon is growing their cloud division and therefore hiring. Um, so DevOps engineers, cloud architects and more. Demican is an advanced AWS consulting partner and remote first company. So we just talked about that already. So um, if you want to bring your expertise in AWS, infrastructures, code, and so on, uh, you should check out uh, the show notes or video descriptions for details and apply to one of their open positions today. So. Thanks a lot, Vilius. Um, this was a pleasure to talk to you, to learn from you, um, and also to get insights into your career. This was very, very, very interesting to me. Uh, thank you a lot. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk about serverless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. <laughs>